so much for coming out. Uh, it means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I love to see so many friendly faces here. Uh, it's lovely to do this show in Sydney as well. I, I love Sydney. I've just moved back here after, uh, after a, a few years in the wilderness down in Melbourne. I've been here for two months, which is exciting. Uh, get, as soon as I get here, right, disaster strikes. I uh, lose my credit card. It was $2,500, which is a nightmare. That's like three grams of cocaine in this city. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever lost your credit card before and you've taken money, but the bank don't make it easy to get it back, right? In fact, they have this weird process where they ring you up, they let you know the card's gone, they let you know the money's gone, and they wait for you to ask for it back. <laughs> right, it's very bizarre. This is what happened. The guy from the bank rang me up and he was like, hey, mate, need to let you know your credit card's gone. And they've taken $2,500. And then there was a 15-second pause on the phone. <laughs> and I was like, well, can I have it back then? <laughs> and he goes, yep. And that was a whole fucking conversation, right? Like, I don't know what he thought I was going to say. Oh, hold on to it, mate. Maybe give the banks a break. Like, no. Give me my money, right? And uh, I said, you know, at least find me through what's happening. He said, yeah, sure, man, no worries. So firstly, we're going to refund the money in six to eight days, but this is what's gone down, right? So they've got a new credit card and uh, they've gone to an ATM in Western Sydney and they've taken out $500 cash, right? Then they've gone to a jet ski store in Ashfield and spent $2,000, uh, probably bought a jet ski. Um, <laughs> But don't worry, we'll have the money back to you in six to eight days. Right? And when I heard that, I was like, okay, cool, six to eight days, two and a half thousand dollars, a jet ski. Can I just have the fucking jet ski? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, that's my jet ski now, right? Like, I bought that jet ski with my money. I was never going to buy a jet ski normally, but this hero has gone out there and taken the initiative. <laughs> also, I don't know if you know much about jet skis, but $2,000 is well under the recommended retail price. <laughs> right? He's a fucking bargain hunter. Like, we should be celebrating this guy, not bringing him down. So I said that to the guy on the phone. I was like, look, mate, I'll just take the jet ski. And he goes, this is not an episode of The Price is Right. Um, I don't think you know how this works. I was like, ha, 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 give me a jet ski. And he's like, mate, I'm from the fraud department at the bank. We don't deal in jet skis. And I was like, not my problem, man. Give me a fucking jet ski. He goes, mate, I can't give you a jet ski. And I was like, fine, are you going to be like that? And he said, look, sir, I'm just doing my job. And I said, are you going to be like that? And he said, sir, I'm just doing my job. And I said, fine. In that case, can you please transfer me to a police department because uh, I'd like to report a stolen jet ski. <laughs> it's out the front of the Enmore Theatre right now, ready to go. It is lovely to do this show in the Enmore Theatre, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when I found out I was doing the Enmore Theatre, I was very excited. I was like, oh, the Enmore Theatre. How good is that? Uh, maybe a bit of a misprint. Uh, maybe it should be called the Enmore Theatre Closet. Because um, <laughs> this is a fucking fire hazard, right? This is... This is Daniel for tease off, we're all going down in here. Um, but I do appreciate you all coming out. The show is called Taunts Down For What? Now, I don't know what that means, right? Now, if you're after a big theatrical ending, like at the end I go, oh, I know it's Taunts Down For What? And then we all end up in tears. Like, that's not going to happen. Um, what happened, when I started comedy about three and a half years ago, there was a very uh, popular trap song at the time called Turn Down For What? Now, uh, a young Sam, already comedic brain working, was like, you know what? If I ever do a solo show, I'm just going to put my name in that song title. How fucking funny is that, right? <laughs> Fast forward three and a half years, no one knows what the fuck that song is, right? So, just fielding interviews going, what's Taunts Down For What? I'm like, don't worry about it, it's fine. <laughs> It's fun. But like I said, it's lovely to do this show in Sydney, right? I've spent so much time in my life in Sydney. Uh, but this show, in many ways, is a bit of a love letter to Melbourne, right? I've lived in Melbourne for the last three and a half years. I've only just left it. And I love Melbourne, right? I love everything about Melbourne. Uh, it's one of my favourite places in the world. Uh, and I love stupid things about Melbourne, even the shitty things that no one... Like Melbourne weather. I love Melbourne weather, right? Melbourne weather is so good. I even love Melbourne summer, right? Because it's so different to the rest of the country. Like, the rest of Australia gets, like, a proper summer. Do you know what I mean? It's like three months of extended heat. But down in Melbourne, summer is just five days of 45-degree weather, right? <laughs> Then an Eastern European tennis player will pass out at Rod Laver Arena. <laughs> and the trams stop working. Uh, and then it's back to grey clouds and suicide, right? And <laughs> that's fine, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, that, I lived in Melbourne. I loved it. I knew what it meant. But what it, what it really meant is that when it got hot, everyone was like, we've got to get outside. Right? We've got to get outside, make the most of it, get down to Elwood Beach, tag ourselves on Instagram, get those likes, triple digits or failure. You know the Instagram influencers' <laughs> rules, right? And just means people doing crazy shit outside as soon as it gets hot, right? First hot day of summer this year, I was walking through the park at the top of Melbourne CBD near Burke Street, minding my own business, just walking through the park, and all of a sudden I just get distracted and I just see a guy up against a tree just getting a hand job. <laughs> you know, like, that's Melbourne summer. <laughs> Do I mean, for the rest of the country, that's an inside activity. Um, <laughs> 
But uh, summer rolls around in Melbourne. It's like, fuck it, let's go have a little come in the sun, right? That, um, that'd be a good thing to do for our day. Right? Not just Melbourne, I mean, so I love doing comedy and like, I love doing it all around the country as well, which is so good. I, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to perform in all different areas, not only in Australia, but around the world. But Australia's the best, right, to do comedy. And uh, last year I had to do a show uh, in Kalgoorlie, right? Now, I don't know if anyone hears of it, but we, ooh, yeah, right? Ooh, it's, ooh. Yeah, you will not like this story. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I had to go to no, but I do like Kalgoorlie. Kalgoorlie to me is a lovely place. I love it a lot. Uh, it's if you don't know about it, it's a very isolated mining town in the corner of WA, right? And it's a beautiful place. Uh, everyone there is lovely, except you know they dig holes and they smoke meth, right? And um, <laughs> you know I don't know if you guys can tell by looking at these tight jeans or this Eastern Suburbs fuckboy haircut, but <laughs> I haven't done either of those things. Um, well, I've done one of those things, um, and it didn't involve a shovel, but. Um, it was very exciting to get to Kalgoorlie, right, because I was doing a big, important show. It was part of the Melbourne International Comedy Festival Roadshow, and we are doing a show there, and none of the comedians on the lineup had ever been to Kalgoorlie before. And we were genuinely excited, right? And we landed at the airport, and we got into a cab, and the cab driver said to us, said, hey, guys, welcome to Kalgoorlie. It's actually a very exciting time to be here, because tonight, the Melbourne International Comedy Festival are doing a show, right? And we were kind of in the backseat going, oh, yeah, we know a little bit about that, right? But, <laughs> but before we could say anything at all, he stopped us, and he goes, here's a tip, though. Maybe give it a miss. I caught it last year and it was fucking shit house. <laughs> oh, we got heckled before the gig started. <laughs> right? Which is why I love Australia, right? Because I think that's one of the key defining features of like, Australian life. Right? I think there's two distinct things we have, and that's being cynical, like fuck you for trying, right? Or <laughs> it's just like not even trying at all, right? It just doesn't matter what it is. If we don't have to do something, we won't do it, right? At the last federal election, I was in Sydney. And I was living in Melbourne at the time and I had to do an out-of-town vote. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever done one of these in here before, but it's very simple, right? What you do, you uh, walk into a polling booth, you show them some ID, they verify your address, they tick you off on a list, they hand you a voting paper, they put you in a booth, they're like, yay democracy, don't fuck it like Brexit, right? Very simple to do, right? <laughs> also, I should point out that I love voting time in Australia, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, think it's the best time to be an Australian because uh, I feel like it splits people into two camps, right? And not politically. I feel like either, people are either like, well, this is ridiculous, right? I pay my taxes, I've given up my Saturday, I didn't get a sausage, fuck off, right? <laughs> or people are like, well, it's important that we vote. Right? It's important that we vote because this is going to affect how people on the world stage think about Australia. What we're doing right now is very important on the global stage. People are thinking about Australia. People are watching Australia right now. And I love that one, ladies and gentlemen, because I don't know if you've ever travelled overseas before, but if you have, you'd know that no one on the world stage is thinking about Australia. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Till that stingray got Steve Irwin, no one knew where the fuck we were, right? It, <laughs> R.I.P. Steve, too soon, I agree. Um, <laughs> but I've walked into this polling booth in Sydney, right, very excited to do my first out-of-town vote, and I've walked in, I put my ID on the table, the guy goes, oh, cool, you're from Melbourne. And I was like, yeah. We had a quick chat about Melbourne, he was like, oh, yeah, laneways, lattes, hand jobs in summer, and I was like, oh, yeah, that checks out. Um, <laughs> and then he's ticked me off on the list, he's verified who I was, he handed me the voting paper for the House of Representatives, but then he handed me the New South Wales Senate paper. And I said, no, no, sorry, buddy. Uh, as we've just discussed, I live in Melbourne, which is in the state of Victoria, so I'll need the Victorian Senate paper, right? And when he heard that, he goes, oh, right. Then without moving, he kind of looked around. <laughs> and then he goes, I don't think I've got one of those. <laughs> and I was like, well, like, what do you want me to do? How am I going to vote? And ladies and gentlemen, I don't like to play into stereotypes very often because I don't feel they often tell the truth. But this guy said the most Australian thing I've ever heard in my life, right? He just looked back at me and he just goes, fuck, maybe give the Senate a miss this year, mate. <laughs> and I did, right? Like, I just, I just didn't vote at the last federal election, right? I just thought, you know what, fuck it. There is nothing more Australian than having a crack at something than giving up early on, right? And look what happened to the Senate. It's a mess down there, right? It's all my fault. It's so funny, right? Like, some countries go to war for the right to, you know, vote. We're just like, fuck it. What does it matter, right? What does it matter? Fucking throw the... Draw a dick on it. Doesn't matter, right? Like, <laughs> doesn't matter. I feel like that kind of attitude just crosses into, like, other parts of society as well. Like, we're secretly entitled. We don't even realise. The other day, I was at the airport. I was from Sydney back to Melbourne, and I was flying Jetstar because comedy's going very well. And um, <laughs> I was boarding the plane, right? And as I was boarding the plane, I got distracted because there was a lady arguing with the woman at the Jetstar counter because she was trying to take a cello as carry-on luggage. <laughs> right, what kind of travel maverick 
are we dealing with here? That someone just backs themselves to get a cello and just fit it in the overhead compartment. Right, I've never seen anything like this. I was so confused. So I just kind of continued watching as I was boarding and I just sort of continue arguing. And then just under a breath, she just shook her head and she just goes, fucking Jetstar. <laughs> Not like it's Jetstar's fault. Like Jetstar are the only anti-cello airline. And they go, like, you fly anyone else, you fly Virgin. Like, oh, you got a cello. Oh, fucking fantastic. Come this way to the orchestra room. Um, <laughs> chuck it next to the double bass. Like, no. Unless there's a secret Yo-Yo Ma gig you got to get to. No cello. Right? I love that, right? I love that a lot. Because I think you'd only see that, you know, on an Australian airline, right? I think you'd only see that in an Australian airport. Because if you've ever flown overseas, you're not worrying about cellos. Do you know what I mean? You're not worrying about any musical instruments, right? I was uh, recently in Malaysia and I had to fly from Kuala Lumpur to Penang and I was flying an airline called Firefly. Now, I don't know if anyone here knows about the airline Firefly, but basically it's the budget airline of Malaysian Air, right? So, <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys know Malaysian Air. <laughs> but they lost a few planes a few years ago. <laughs> Somehow they have a shitter option <laughs> if you absolutely want to roll the fucking dice, right? That's, that's what it says on the ticket. You think it's a misprint. You're like, oh, no, I'm rolling the dice. Fantastic, right? That's, well, this costs $31. That makes sense, right? And... It was like proper budget airline stuff, do you know what I mean? Like I had to walk through the door and the guy goes, oh, just walk down those stairs and get onto a bus. You know that bus that goes for like 45 minutes out along the road? To that bus? Like that's why the flight's so cheap, because you're going half the distance on the fucking bus, right? <laughs> and we get into this bus, we all pile in, the bus takes off along the road, we're getting closer and closer to this plane. And this Firefly plane did not look good, right? It looked like a scene from MASH. Um, you know, this plane looked like it had gone through the Korean War. Um, <laughs> Pretty sure Suicide is Painless was playing over the speakers. Hawkeye was there with a martini. Like, it was all happening. <laughs> and finally the bus stopped, right? And everyone started getting out of the bus. And then the guy driving the bus, the bus driver, right? <laughs> he gets out of the bus. He starts walking towards the plane. <laughs> he walks into the plane <laughs> and then into the pilot's cockpit. <laughs> Um, the bus driver was the fucking pilot, right? <laughs> what kind of next level budget airline shit is that? Where you can be a moonlighting, bus driving... <laughs> like, they're two things that can never go together. Do you know what I mean? You can't, that'd be like being a high-end investment banker and having a real passion for cleaning the shit out of a toilet <laughs> on the weekend. Like, you can't do those two things. And I still don't know what happened. Like, I have no idea what happened. This was a year ago, and I think about it every morning... <laughs> When I wake up, because I don't know, like, what came first in that situation. Do you know what I mean? Like, what happened first there? Was that guy, like, like a pilot first? <laughs> and, like, then he became a bus driver. Because, like, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? I see what's happened there. That's an HR fuck-up, right? He, uh, <laughs> he's on a terrible workplace contract, but he will adjust, right? <laughs> but if this guy's a bus driver... <laughs> Then what kind of Make-A-Wish Foundation shit is this? <laughs> then every day this dude's just driving these buses, watching these planes take off over the top, just going, I reckon I could fucking do that, actually. Um, they've just backed him in, right? Hard times, right? It is, uh, it is lovely, like I said, to do the show in Sydney. It's lovely to come back to Sydney. Getting away from Melbourne, I, I, you know, there's a few things I you know, do miss. I, uh, I was living in a share house down in Melbourne that I love. Does anyone here live in a share house? Woo! All right. <laughs> Well, that's a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm for... Uh, well, maybe there is, right? Because I've heard there are good share houses. Maybe you've got a good share house. Like, I've heard there's good ones, like, you know, on the TV show Friends. Um, <laughs> you know, or, like, on Instagram accounts of people that are happy with their lives. But, like, I lived in an inner city crack den, right? Like, like honestly, like, walking into this house was like walking on set of a World Vision ad, right? There was just dirt all over the floor and just always some weird old guy that kind of looked like Bob Geldof just hanging out in the corner. It's like we all hate Mondays, mate, but fuck off, right? Um, right, this house, not only was this house like, like dirty and stru like structurally bad, like it had some serious structure issues, right? Like there was a, there was a mould spot in the kitchen, right? Like where we prepared food, there was a mould spot. Um, and if you went to touch it, right, and you shouldn't fucking touch it, by the way, but if you got to touch it, your hand kind of disappeared into the wall like Harry Potter trying to get onto platform nine and three quarters, right? It was grim. We didn't have anything in there. Didn't own a fork, right? Before Uber Eats. What do you do without forks, right? 
can't eat, right? No good. <laughs> Just going hungry, right? We didn't have stuff. We didn't, uh, didn't have a dishwasher, right? Oh, never lived in a house with a dishwasher ever. Right, still to this day, to me, owning a dishwasher is like the epitome of wealth, right? <laughs> I don't think it gets above dishwasher money ever. Like if I ever walk into a house and there's a dishwasher, I think, oh, fuck, I'm in Gina Reinhardt's kitchen, right? How, <laughs> how did that happen, right? And it's such a different game, like we're coming back up to Sydney, like I deal with these conversations with my mum all the time. It's like, oh, Sam, uh, you uh, think about buying a house? Sam, you think about buying a house? Have you thought about buying a house? Sam, you think about, have you looked at the market? You think about buying a house? Sam, I've had four glasses of white wine. You think about buying a house? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, mum, I've thought about this, right? And, uh, you know, the only house I'm ever going to own is yours. <laughs> when you're dead, right? Like that's... Do you know what I mean? I did an arts degree at university and I do this. I'll never own property in this country ever, right? And uh, I feel like, you know, I don't hate boomers. I don't hate, like, I just feel like, like my mum in particular and a lot of boomers, they just don't get it, right? Do you know what I mean? Because like my mum, for example, like, you know, bought a house so long ago. Do you know what I mean? Like, like 40 years ago. And if you ever talk to one of these people that bought a house, like fucking 1978, you say, how would you pay for your house in the 70s? They always have the same bullshit answer. Right? It's always like, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was looking at this the other day. Um, oh yeah, it was $300. <laughs> And I threw in a loaf of bread and a ladder. It's like, <laughs> like I'm looking at squatters' rights at the moment, right? Like that's all that's in my portfolio, right? It's grim, right? You know, other disasters, no dishwasher, right? Uh, we, had a, we had a grim moment, ladies and gentlemen. Our washing machine broke. Uh, who's got a washing machine here? Yeah. Oh, lardy fucking da. All right. Uh, <laughs> My washing machine broke, and I was all up for buying a new washing machine, but then my housemate was like, no, Sam, we'll just go to the laundromat. Right, and when I heard that, my ears pricked up, because I was like, oh, the laundromat. Because in my head, I was like, this is going to be like a 90s rom-com, right? And I'm just going to meet the love of my life at the laundromat. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll be down there, and I'll like, lock eyes with a girl near the dryers, right? I'll be smiling at each other. And then the next week, we'll be like flirting near the soap dispenser. You know, and then three days later, I'll just finger in the corner, you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> No, that's a bad joke, right? But uh, I quickly realised, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, it's never going to happen, right? Because the only people I'm ever going to meet at laundromats um, don't own washing machines. No, I don't want to fuck someone that doesn't own a washing machine. <laughs> so, I mean, they're dirty and they don't have much money. Yucky, right? Ugh, gross. Ugh. Ugh. Imagine. But uh, everyone that hangs out at laundromats, they're on another planet, ladies and gentlemen. They're like, they're, they're like on another planet, right? It's crazy. Like, and I'm slowly becoming one of these people. The other day I was in there and I had to wash my sheets, right? Huge day on the Sam Taunton calendar, right? And I was in there and I was putting my sheets in the machine and there was a guy at the machine next to me just staring at me, not saying anything for like two minutes, right? Finally he pipes up and he goes, hey, bro. And I was like, yeah. And then he goes, sheet day! <laughs> I was like, we've absolutely cracked this case, Chief. Um, <laughs> not sure what the giveaway was. And I was like, fuck, I've got to get out of here. Right? So I started speeding up. I was putting my sheets in. I was putting the money in. was about to put the soap in and run away. And he pipes up again. He goes, hey, bro. And I was like, yeah. And then he goes, how often do you clean your sheets? <laughs> yeah, right. I was like, oh, dear. Right? Because <laughs> the answer to this question, ladies and gentlemen, is one that you want to bottle down deep inside forever and ever. Do you know what I mean? You do. You just want to keep pushing it down further and further. Never let it out. You just keep pushing it down further and further. Like, how often do you go to the toilet or where your dad really left, right? You just keep pushing it down. <laughs> further, but, like, I snapped. Straight away, I couldn't help it. I snapped. I was like, oh, look, man, to be honest, probably, like, you know, I don't know, once a month. And then he looked at me <laughs> like I had just done a shit in my hands in front of him and started wiping it all over my face. Like, I've never seen anyone look more shocked in his life. He was like, it was like once a month. He goes, once a month, that's disgusting. He goes, do you know the toxins that are coming out of your skin every night onto your sheets? Every night onto your sheets. You're doing that for a whole month. That's 30 days. That's 31 days, depending on what calendar month you're living in. That's disgusting. <laughs> and I was like, all right, nappy sand mum. Um, <laughs> how often are you cleaning your sheets? Quick as a flash, she just goes twice a week. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck, right? <laughs> like, what kind of Dexter-level activity <laughs> is going on in your bedroom that you have to clean your sheets twice a week, right? Once I spilled half a chicken parmigiana in my bed, even then it was fortnightly, you know? Like, <laughs> like it just rolled over. I didn't use the left side of my bed for eight days. It was fine. 
twice a week. That's f- like, if, how does he find time in his life to do that, right? Because not only does he have to clean the sheets, then he's got to dry the sheets, then he's got to put the fucking sheets on a bed. Have you ever tried to put a fitted sheet on a bed? <laughs> right, that is an eight day ordeal, right? If I ever invited a girl late at home late at night and had done my washing, I had to be like, oh, first, you grab that end. I'll <laughs> grab that end. 45 minutes later, we might have been able to have sex, right? And then I've got to deal with the doona cover, right? And I, and I, everyone in this room right now is looking at me going, oh, no, Sam, there's actually a trick to putting on the doona cover, right? Once you know the trick, you're going to love it. It's actually it's so easy once you know the trick to putting on a doona cover. It's so easy. Actually, it'll become the best part of your day once you know the trick. It's so easy, right? Actually, if you want to schedule everything around it, you'll put a glass of white wine, put some music on, burn some incense. Once you know the trick, it's so fucking easy, right? Oh, do you want to know the trick? I'll tell you the trick. Right? You want to know the trick to putting on a doona cover? It's so easy, right? This is what you do. You get each side of the doona cover, open it up, get the doona, start slowly inserting the doona into the doona cover, bring each side of the doona cover down. Doona cover ends on perfect, right? Easy. So easy, isn't it? No, right? <laughs> what happens is I get each side of the doona cover, I start slowly inserting the doona into the doona cover, somehow I end up stuck inside <laughs> the doona cover, slowly suffocating halfway to fucking Narnia. <laughs> and I have to get my housemate to come and pull me out. If I had to do that twice a week, right? If I was doing that twice a week, <laughs> Right? I get it now. I totally get it, right? I would lose my mind, right? I would go crazy. I would just go up to random people in laundromats and just be like, SHEET DAY! (laughs) That's too much. It's too much. You know, it's hard looking back, you know, like dealing with, you know, washing machines. I grew up, I had two washing machines, right? Didn't know how good I had it, right? (laughs) Could have had two loads on any time. Do you know what I mean? Sheets and whites, doesn't matter. I could just be rocking too. It's fine. I, uh, I grew up in a town called Nowra in uh, New South Wales uh, on the south coast. Oh, a few fans in. Uh, and uh, I don't know. It's always hard to explain Nowra to, uh, to some people. Like, and uh, well, this is a really part of the show, but this is how I describe Nowra to be. A lot of time when I say, oh, like I'm from Nowra, people say, oh, I've driven through there, right? Which is um, not a glowing endorsement for the tourism board of the Shoalhaven, but still, that's what they say. And uh, I think now it's probably best known for two things, right? Uh, uh, the start of last year, there was uh, a documentary on the ABC uh, on chronic meth use in the community. And uh, the other thing it's known for is uh, a similar time, uh, a dog got stuck in a wombat hole and that somehow became national news. <laughs> Right, and like Koshi was down there, like Carl Stefanovic and Lisa were down there, like it was the who's who of breakfast television. And uh, the community gathered together, and they all brought down shovels to where this hole was, and they dug the dog out of the hole, and it was this huge uplifting moment. It was on the paper of every news outlet around the country. And then they went to present the dog to the dude that owned the dog, and then they found out, just as they were about to present him, that he was wanted for serious crimes, <laughs> like all around the country, and they arrested him on live TV. <laughs> Sorry, I can just drive through, probably. Um, <laughs> That's no good. I still go back to now a lot. I've got a lot of uh, family, a lot of friends there. My, uh, one of my best mates in the entire world, he lives there still. He's uh, only got one testicle. Um, <laughs> not really relevant, but uh, it, is, it is weird. When I bring that up and I tell people he's only got uh, one testicle, they always say this. They always say, oh, he's got one testicle. I'm like, yeah. And they go, oh, was he sick? I'm like, what? They go, yeah, the guy with one testicle, was he sick? I'm like, yeah, of course he was fucking sick. <laughs> Do you mean like no one gets a testicle removed on a whim? <laughs> I mean, it's like not a fashion statement. Like, like no one sees Lance Armstrong in his lycra and thinks, fuck, that's all right, get rid of lefty. Like, like no, it doesn't happen. And uh, he's fine now. He's all better, which is good. They, uh, they took it out. And uh, I didn't know if you guys know this, but when someone loses a testicle, like 75% of the time, they put like a fake ball in, right? Like a prosthetic ball. Right now, I don't know why this happens. Right, I don't know if it's like a balance issue. Um, to me, I don't know if you just walk around in circles if you only got one or just bumping off walls, but it happens, right? And when I found this out, I was super excited. I couldn't wait to talk to him. I was like, this is going to be the best. And I rang him out. I was like, mate, like, how's the, tes- the fake testicle? You're like half a transformer now. How fucking good is this, right? And he so casually just goes, nah, I decided not to get it. And I was like, what? Like, why wouldn't you get the fake ball, like the transformer thing, man? Like, why... Wouldn't you do it? And he just looked at me, like, through the phone, which I know is difficult, but <laughs> such was the conviction in his voice that he, on the phone, goes, look, man, I decided not to get it because I've decided it's going to be my party trick. <laughs> I was like, what? He goes, yep, I'm going to do it at parties. I was like, number one, mate, I don't think you know what a trick is. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, that's not a trick. Like, there's nothing magical about that. Like, I don't think anyone is just, like, getting their, like, balls out. Like, I don't think David Copperfield is just getting his balls out at a Las Vegas show and going, well, there you go, thank you very much. Like, <laughs> like also, what kind of parties are you going to? I mean, how many parties have you ruined by just turning up, walking into the kitchen, dropping your dacks and being like, get Sandra. She is going to fucking love this. <laughs> I'll be the life of the party. Like, that's not a trick. That's a crime, right? They, they will lock you up for a long time for doing that, right? But uh, after this conversation, I was thinking about it quite a lot. And I was like, you know, probably too long to be thinking about someone else's testicles, to be fair. But I was thinking about it. I was like, well, if I was at a party, right? And someone came up to me and they're like, hey, do you want to see my testicles? Like, I'd probably leave that party, I reckon. <laughs> Just like, see you, man. I've got some other stuff going on, right? But if I was at a party and someone came up to me and they're like, hey do you want to see my single testicle? I'd be like, we well, don't see that every day, do you? Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Get it out, let's have a look. And you go, oh yeah, there we go. there's only one in there. That um, all checks out. And, um, and you go back inside and get a quiche or something. Um, <laughs> that's what we all do at parties, right? Uh, Growing up now, it was like, it was an interesting time for me because I, like, it was, for me, my, like, childhood growing up, it was, like, in a very hippie household, right? Like, my, uh, my mum was a naturopath and my dad was a country music musician, right, which is uh, very exciting. He won two golden guitars at Tamworth Country Music Festival, uh, uh, which, if you don't know, uh, that's a country music festival that happens every year um, in Tamworth. Um, <laughs> pretty self-explanatory. But uh, he, won, he won two golden guitars, right, and he won, uh, he won one from an album called Straight From The Shoulder, right? And the album cover for this is so good. He's in, like, double denim uh, with, like, you know, like, do a, like a blue shirt and he's got white sneakers on and he's got, like, a Tom Selleck moustache and he's kind of leaning up against a brick wall. It's beautiful. And the lead song off that album was called Sunday Undies, right? <laughs> now, now, that's a song about skinny dipping nude with a large group of people, right? Now, as an eight-year-old, it doesn't really dawn on you the significance of that till you get much older. And you go, ah, oh, so Dad was into some weird pervert shit. All right. <laughs> We're cooking. I see what's going down, Dad, right? Like father, like son. Um, <laughs> right. But it's a very hippie upbringing. And I like, don't have much time for country music, right? I think it's the, the worst form of music there is. Like, to me, all, all you need to do is like, buy an acoustic guitar, learn three chords and a cowboy hat, right? And you're done, right? I'm not, not a fan of it, right? But it was this very hippie upbringing, right? Do you know what I mean? Mum's a naturopath. Dad was this musician. And like, I never really felt like I belonged, right? Because I, I was a big sports person. I loved playing sports. I was really into golf. Um, <laughs> fuck you, that's a sport. Uh, <laughs> It was in the Olympics, right? And <laughs> I never really felt like I belonged. And that kind of continued all through my life and, you know, through school, through university and all the time. And when I moved to Melbourne, you know, it would just always, like, be there. And then the weirdest thing happened when I started to move to Melbourne, and this is 100% true, like three times a week, an old Greek man would come up to me and be like, hey, you a good Greek boy? <laughs> That's my impression of a Greek man, by the way. <laughs> Four years at NIDA for that. Um, I didn't go to NIDA. Um, hey, you're a good Greek boy, right? That's fucking Africa. Like, hey, you're a good Greek boy. Anyway, Wog Boy 3, cast me in it. Let's go. Um, right, but I'm not Greek, right? I'm not Greek at all. I'm not a good Greek boy. Uh, my last name's Taunton. Our family's very Anglo-Saxon. If you follow our family tree, it goes all the way back to Taunton, Somerset in the UK. And this has happened, like, non-stop for the last four years. I just have old men coming out to me going, hey, you're a Greek boy, right? And I'm not Greek at all. I even dated an Italian girl once. Her parents didn't want to talk to me because they're like, oh, you're Greek. We hate the Greeks. I'm like, I'm not Greek, <laughs> right? Honestly, moving back to Sydney, it still happened. It happened twice last week. It happened this morning, right? And I, I can't explain it, right? So I've been thinking about it in depth. And uh, like I said, mum was a naturopath when I was growing up. And uh, she had a, like, a, we had a very good family friend. He was her natural health food supplier. And his name was Tony. And he was a Greek man, right? Now, um, Tony was a very good family friend. Like, he would always be at dinner parties and, uh, you know, functions. He'd pick me up from school. And I have a very vivid memory of my 12th birthday party. And uh, he was tapping me on the head and he was crying. And he was calling me son, right? And <laughs> I was like, holy shit, Tony's my dad. Mum's had an affair with Tony. I am a good Greek boy. The world makes sense. <laughs> right? And I was furious. I was furious. Right? Straight away, I got on the phone. I texted my mum. I was like, all right, mum, the jig's up. I know what you've done. It's bang out of order. And she was like, what? And I'm like, Tony, the Greek guy, you had an affair. He's my dad. And she's like, what the fuck <laughs> are you talking about? I'm like, do not play games, Catherine. I know what's happened here. Tony's... A my dad, Greek man, I'm a good Greek boy, admit it, right? 
And I think she likes to have a bit of fun because she sent me a text back and she said, well, would you rather have a dad that was a country music musician or a Greek man? <laughs> and now I'm Greek. So, <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's my Australian story right there. But growing in this house, growing up in this house, I had like a lot of music going on all the time, right? I, I kind of fell into playing a lot of music as well, which is not something I'm proud of. But when I was in my teen years, I got really into like acoustic guitar and like singing, and you know, you know, sing some covers and like I was the kind of guy at like parties who'd be like going up to the DJ saying, "Hey, man, can we just turn it down? I want to have an acoustic sing along of Hallelujah over here." Like, <laughs> just giving people reasons to bully me and. <laughs> And I got quite confident as well. I remember I made a MySpace music page and uh, I uh, would record some songs and I would put them up there. Um, like, people want to talk about regrets in life. Um, you know, like, I didn't get to see a loved one before they passed away or I never told the girl that I loved her, right? But there are covers of me singing Craig David songs <laughs> floating around on the internet, right? Like, I know what it's like to want a second chance. Right? But it got deeper, ladies and gentlemen. I started writing songs as well. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in love with this girl called Bianca Chan. Right now, I love Bianca Chan so much uh, that uh, you know, I wrote this song about her and I put it up on my MySpace music page. The, uh, the song was called Try, right? And uh, I'll just give you a quick snippet of the song, right? The lead up to the chorus went, you don't seem to notice me, why don't you try? And the chorus went, try, 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 try. <laughs> Like, if I could describe the genre, I'd say John Mayer meets suicide, right? It was <laughs> bad news, right? But I feel like people do that all the time, right? especially young boys. They're full of all this testosterone and energy, and they don't know how to express themselves. So they do crazy stuff like that. They're, like, writing songs for girls. They're making mixtapes and yelling out of cars, buying flowers, right? It's, they're just doing insane shit. And it still continues to this day. Like, last year when I was on the dating scene, right, I, uh, you know, I, was get, I got on Tinder, right? I was like, everyone's doing it. Let's do it. And I started chatting to this girl. And uh, we agreed we we're going to go on a date. We agreed to meet up at midnight, right? That's, that's essentially a blind date at midnight. That's not a date. Um, that's the start of an NCIS episode. Right? That's, that's not a good thing to do, right? And dating's hard, right? We got up to date three or four and she was like, oh, hey, Sam, do you want to come over and watch a movie? And I was like, ha-ha. Oh. Yeah, I do want to come over and watch a movie. Uh, but then when I got there, instead of putting on a movie, uh, she put on that Four Corners documentary into the Indonesian live cattle trade. <laughs> Did anyone catch that one? Um, just sitting on a lounge watching cows get slaughtered in an Indonesian abattoir. And like, what happened to Netflix and chill? You know, like, more like I view and cry, right? It was, Pathetic. But I get it, right? Like, it's, dating's hard, right? It's a hard world out there. And the problem I find with dating, I think a lot of people agree with that, is that there's always different levels you have to get to. And it doesn't matter what stage your relationship you're into, there's always a different level you've got to get to. And it starts off, it's like, are we exclusive? Are we telling people? Do we put it on Facebook? Do we tell our family? It's like, do we move to, in together? And it just keeps going on and on and on forever till it's like, do I put her in a nursing home, right? Like, it just, <laughs> it just, just never ends, right? It never ends, right? And uh, last year, I was... Uh, I was seeing a girl at the start of the year and uh, we got to one of these levels, right? We got to one of these big stages in, ever, in everyone's relationship, you get to one of these. And she said, hey, Sam, I'm ready to go to the stage of our relationship where I want to have sex without a condom, right? <laughs> and I was like, sick. Like, like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, what do you, what do you say in that situation? I was just like, oh, thank you very much. You know, like, <laughs> was just like, you know, be as gentlemanly as you can, but in the head you're going, it's just going, yeah! Like, it's... <laughs> Right, and uh, I'll never forget it, right? And it was a Tuesday morning. Um, lock the doors, it's gonna get quite dirty. And um, we went to start having sex, right? We got in like the missionary position, right? And I only have like five sex positions, right? And one of them's a hand job. So it was, <laughs> it was all happening, right? And, and we started, and I reckon like, like 10 seconds in, or like four like p pumps, I'm so sorry. Um, I was like, I'm, I'm going to finish up here. Um, <laughs> and that's like a nightmare situation to be. And everyone in this room, you're all looking at me, right? Going, everyone in this room's been on either end of that before. And it's like, if, it's like a MacGyver moment, right? You don't know what to do. You're like looking for a lock to pick that'll somehow get you out of it. Like a plane flies over that you can grab on and just fuck off, right? But the, <laughs> but the plane never comes, right? And you've just got to deal with it. You've got to deal with what you've got at the time. I was like, what can I do? And then it hit me. I was like, the only option is I'll get her to go on top. She goes on top. I get like 30 more seconds 
how good would 30 more seconds be, right? Do you know what I mean? So I was like, you go on top. And she was like, what? And I was like, just please go on top. And she was like, oh, all right. But because we're in the missionary position, she's gone that way so we could swap over and I've gone that way. But in the process of her going that way and me going that way, I've kind of like, 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 <laughs> like, like come out of her. And that's kind of put me over the edge. <laughs> and I just started finishing. And... <laughs> But, bec <laughs> but because she's gone this way and I've gone that way so we could move, I've had to like move over to this side of the bed and put all my weight on the side of the mattress and the mattress kind of just went and I just started falling off <laughs> the side of the bed. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you've ever come mid-air before. <laughs> right, you have to make a choice. Do you know what I mean? It's not a good choice. Right? It's not like going to a wedding where they're like, oh, chicken or your fish. You're like, no, it's like, oh, do I do it on the carpet? And like... <laughs> No, you don't want to do it on the carpet because not only do you ruin the carpet, but then you land on it and you end up with it all over your shoulder. And, like, you look like a fucking idiot down at the shops for the next two weeks, right? So I went with option number two because uh, I was a very promising cricketer growing up. So um, I just kind of channeled Steve Smith at first slip and just kind of caught it <laughs> in my... Like, stop, drop and rolled. For me, it was like the worst version of KFC Classic Catches ever, right? <laughs> And like the poor girl, she didn't know what happened. Do you know what I mean? She had no idea what happened because she's just moved over to this side of the bed and looked over and I'm on the ground, just like hunched up like Gollum, just like looking at her on the verge of tears. And she was like, you didn't, you, would, you wouldn't have just. And like, I couldn't lie to her, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Like, she literally called me come handed, right? So like, that's why I hate dating because it's so hard. It's tough. I don't know. I think, like, you know, people don't get taught how to interact properly with different sexes. Because, like, when we're growing up, people don't teach you things. Do you know what I mean? Now, maybe it's different now. Maybe if you're a parent now, you know that kids... Because kids are so smart these days. Do you know what I mean? Kids have so much access to information and technology and they just know all things. Like, when I was growing up, there was none of that. There was only one thing that me and my friends had to know when we were growing up. There was only one thing that our whole generation knew when we were growing up, and that was be alert, because at any moment, you could get dacked. <laughs> like, that was fucking huge right like at any moment you could just be walking along someone could come up from behind you pull your pants down and you just had to be like oh got me good right like I don't know why but it was the only form of sexual assault where you had to be like actually fair play well done like it didn't make sense right? I remember I got dacked once at my high school assembly in front of 1400 other students now that is a cr definitely a crime right and I got dacked by a kid called Stephen Ross, right? And uh, my principal, who was on stage at the time, just looked at that, leaned into the microphone and goes, ha, 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 got him good, Rosso. <laughs> Doesn't check out, right? Spent my entire youth worrying about getting dacked, right? And kids now are so smart. Do you know Kids now are so smart. I met a 12-year-old the other day. It was the smartest 12-year-old I've ever met in my life, right? He was so smart. I was, uh, I was working at a music festival at Manly Beach, right? Now, I, uh, I work uh, for a cable TV network in this country right now, uh, and I'm like a presenter, and I'm not trying to brag in any way by saying that, because being, uh, you know, on cable TV in Australia is very similar to not being on TV at all, right? Um, <laughs> you know, everyone's like, oh, we've got Netflix and hobbies. Shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> But I was down there at this music festival, I was on the beach, and the demographic for this music festival was uh, like kids between the age of 12 to 15 that were like Carl Stefanovic after the Logies level drunk. I've <laughs> never seen anything like it in my life. It was like Oz kick training for schoolies. Like people were like, we'll be ready to go in four years' time. Right? And I was down there, and this was my job for the day, right? I was there with a the camera, and I had to ask punters this one question. I had to go up to people at the festival and say, hey, how's your festival going? So you wonder why cable TV is dying in this country <laughs> with content like that. And I was down there on the beach and I was asking these people these questions and all of a sudden I saw the scariest looking 12 year old of my life, right? Now, this guy had no shirt on, he had a gold Sopranos chain around his neck, he had a goon bag in one hand and a cigarette in the other and he walked straight up to me and he goes, cunt, put me on TV. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I'm about to get in a fight with a 12-year-old. Cool, right? And then he flicked the cigarette at me and I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm about to lose a fight to a 12-year-old. 
And I was like, well, that doesn't really matter, I guess. Because if you fight a 12-year-old, no one's like, oh, did you win? <laughs> How'd you go? Did you get a few good shots in? Like, what happened? Like, everyone's like, no, get ready for a current affair to come knocking because you are going to be famous. But I was down there on the beach. I was thinking, this guy came up and he was terrified, right? And I was like, I didn't know what to do. But I was like, I was scared, but I wanted to protect my crew and my producer around me. So I was like, I know what I'll do. I'll just ask him the question. I won't aggravate the beast. If I can't aggravate the, aggravate the 12-year-old beast, he can't hurt me, right? So I was like, hey, bro, come here. And before I could even ask him the question, he grabs the mic. He looks down the barrel of the camera and he goes, bro, I'm a DJ, rock and roll forever, Biggie lives. Drop mics, walks away. <laughs> I was like, Biggie lives? I was like, you're 12. You're already on conspiracy theories at 12. Right, when I was 12, all I had was a bus part, a Meccano set, and an erection every time aerobics old style came on. <laughs> Is that conspiracy theories? Like, honestly, like, I just also love the idea that he was down there on the beach and he saw me with the camera and he was like, I've got to tell him about Biggie. <laughs> I've got to tell him about it. I've got to get this. I'm 12. I've got to get this out. And then he's walked over and he was like, then before he did it, he was like, fuck, I can't just go straight in with a conspiracy theory. That's weird. Do you know what I mean? I can't go in that. Hard. That'd be like going up to someone at a cafe and just being like, the Jews own all the banks and fucking off, right? <laughs> so he's like, so he's like, I'll pepper it. I'll pepper it. You know what? I'll start with uh, what I do. What I do. That's right. I'm a DJ. I'm a 12 year old DJ. See. What am I into? Oh, yeah, rock and roll music, a genre that hit its peak 30 years ago. I'm 12, right? And then at the last moment, he's bailed out of it, right? He's just gone, you know what? I'm not going to tell them, but I'm going to pepper it and they can find it out themselves. <laughs> Jermaine, I'll just go, oh, Biggie lives. Drop mics, walks away. <laughs> and the reason I tell you that story, ladies and gentlemen, is not only highlight the, uh, the intelligence that kids have and, you know, have their thinking beyond what I did when I was growing up, but also the broadcast came out two weeks after that and I got cut and he made it in. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's tough going. But having this job, right, having this job and, like, you know, doing stand-up comedy is such an egotistical thing to do because I'm like, you know, I, I can talk better than people, right? Which is not true, as you've all seen tonight, but that's what I think, right? And it's kind of crossed over into other areas of my life. And we all have these brief periods of egotism in our life, right? And uh, one of my new favourite things to do uh, is Google myself, right? Now, you know, shut up. You've all done it, right? And... <laughs> And when you do it, right, it's the same for everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. When you Google yourself, you go through the first page and it's all like normal stuff. It's all like social media links, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter. It might be like a news story of when you were playing sport when you were growing up or maybe you saved a cat in a tree or something and there's a newspaper clipping. And then you get to the second page and you get halfway down and then you're like, oh, shit, I am deep web already. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, if you went home right now and you Google yourself, I guarantee you'd go first page, normal, normal, halfway down, second page, and be like, oh, wow. There's a video of a guy in a Teletubby costume fucking an exhaust pipe. Um, <laughs> how is my name associated with that, right? What did I do, right? And one morning at the start of this year, I woke up and I was in a real good mood. Don't know why, can't explain it, but I uh, woke up right side of the bed and uh, I was like, you know what, I'm going to Google myself. This is happening. Let's do it. Let's get on the old computer and Google ourselves. Got in, tied my name in, Sam Taunton, bang, same as always. First page comes up, normal stuff, just kind of like geeks for comedy, links and stuff. Social media pages, my Twitter account was there, at Sam Taunton if you want to get involved in the conversation. And <laughs> I got to the second page and I got halfway down and all of a sudden I saw a MySpace music page for a guy called Sam Taunton. Right? <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Right? There's a guy there called Sam Taunton like, you know, doing music. Like, how amazing is that? That's, like, beautiful. I love that, right? I've, I've, like, I've got to check this out. Clicked on the link. The song Try started playing. <laughs> and I just started dry reaching. I was like, oh, my God, no. Like, couldn't comprehend. I just shut the laptop. Like, I'd just seen a sex tape of my parents rooting. I was like, fuck that, right? I can't watch. It was horrific, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've actually got the song for you to play right now. Now, the great man Ian on the ones and twos has it ready to go. And if you look under your seat, you will find a lyric sheet to the song try. It's in 16 year old taunts right now. Something right behind your door. What are we here for? Uh, early reviews were quite Dylan esque, to be honest. Um, The only thing I think of, the only thing I know, the whole town. It can't be far now. Are you guys getting on board with this? I like, I can't tell, right? <laughs> this is the pre-chorus. You don't seem to notice me. Why don't you try? So what I'm trying to convey here is that I want Bianca Chan to try with me. I'm not sure if that's coming through. 
why don't you try? And then we get to the chorus uh, that you'd, maybe it'll help there. You should try. We should try. And, and, and now we get to the hook, my favourite part. We should try, 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 try. All right, turn it off, Ian. We've heard enough. Oh, no. No, no, don't be silly. Shush, shush. That, uh, that song goes for another eight minutes. Um, yeah, my mate Dane played a guitar solo at the end. Like, it fills out, right? It's pretty good. Also, you're welcome to keep those uh, lyric sheets, ladies and gentlemen. Um, they, uh, they've got the chord progressions on there, if... Uh, if you like learning at home. Also, my contact details are there if anyone wants to get in touch with songwriting opportunities. Also, bank account and BSB. If anyone like, thinks about throwing a few bucks my way, it would uh, really appreciate it. Um, so, I mean, it's easier than a Patreon. Um, uh, <laughs> but this song started playing. I was just like, I was like, oh, my God. I've opened the laptop back up. And I was like, I'm going to have to listen. This is horrific. And all these memories started flooding back about Bianca Chan and, like, all these songs telling the DJ to shut up. And I couldn't believe it, right? And then I was looking around the MySpace page because, you know, I haven't been on there for so many years and I looked at the play count for the song Try and the song Try had 311,000 plays. <laughs> Look around this room, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's more people than have ever seen me do comedy ever, right? Like, <laughs> like I'm going to get recognised on the street as a Jason Moran's fuckboy before I get recognised <laughs> as a comedian. Also, 311,000 plays, right? Like, I, I could be massive in another country and, like, not even know about it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> this could be, like, the Australian story of Sugar Man, right? Just being huge... <laughs> in South Africa, I don't even know, or like how Vanessa Amorosi went to number one in Germany eight times, like I could be fucking huge in Kazakhstan and I'm just wasting my time hitting the comedy circuit of Australia, right? And I was like, fuck, I've got to get this offline. I was like, I can't have this online. I, like, if people Google me and wanted to book me for comedy stuff or want to know about me being as a comedian, they're going to find this page, they're going to think I'm a musical comedian or something like that. I'm like, no, it's not that, right? So I was like, I've got to get it offline. So straight away, tried to log into the MySpace page. Bang. Couldn't remember the password. I was just trying different versions of Sam 69 over and over again. And <laughs> I couldn't get in, right? And then I was like, password reset. And then I got to the password reset section and it was like, hey, what you need to do, we need to, to get the postcode you were in when you created the account. And I was like, oh, you know, like, I didn't know the postcode. Like, you know, I was like 16, you know, I was in love with Bianca Chan. I was getting erections on buses. Like, I don't, I wasn't, I didn't have a compass is what I'm saying, right? Like, I didn't know where I was and I couldn't remember it. And I was like, fuck it. So I hit the button to, like, contact MySpace directly. And I sent this big email to them saying, hey, I'm locked out. I'd really like to get this page down. Uh, and I got an email pretty quick back from a webmaster saying, hey, Sam, not sure if you realise, but MySpace doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Like, like, I don't know if you know, but five years ago, it just shut down, right? Like, I don't know what Tom's doing now. Like, I don't know if he's in that, like, creepy jerking off photo, like... But he's, he's definitely not replying to regretful 16-year-olds. So I was in a panic. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I just Googled it, right? And I ended up on a Reddit forum. Now, I don't know if you've been on Reddit, but there's a lot of nerds there. And uh, I'm, I was one of them, right? I am one of them. I'm there all the time. And I typed in, I was like, hey, guys... Uh, how do you get a MySpace music page offline that when you wrote for a, girl, a song for a girl when you were 16, right? Now, surprisingly, a lot of answers, right? <laughs> a lot of young boys done some stuff they don't want to admit, right? And everyone had the same, like, the same response. Like, if you don't know the password reset, the only thing you can do uh, is pay a private IT company to take the page offline. And they all provided a bunch of li links, and I was like, great, let's do it. Let's get it offline. Clicked on a link, started chatting to a dude, and the guy was like, hey, Sam, I can take it offline straight away, it'll be off by tomorrow morning, but it's gonna cost you $300, right? And I was like, $300? I was like, the song's bad, but it's not $300 bad. <laughs> like, three, that's so much money. I was like, I'm not gonna pay that. And all of a sudden, something just cl clicked. It was like a light bulb moment in my life. And I was like, you know what, no. I'm not going to take it offline. Like, I need to own who I am. I need to own everything I've done in my past. It, no matter how embarrassing it is, how stupid it is, everything I've done in the past you know, creates the person I am today. And I want to I wanna be the person I am today. Like, I want to be a comedian. I need fuck shit to talk about, right? And this is pretty fucked, right? Like, <laughs> this is, and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do it, right? And it was definitely an epiphany moment in my life because I remember just shutting the laptop saying, don't worry about it, bro. And I went and had the best day of my life. I felt like I'd been freed, right? And I remember walking down the streets. I was talking to people on the streets like a normal, crazy person. <laughs> I remember that I went out and I did a gig that night and I came home and I went to bed and I was happier, maybe happier than I've ever been in my life. And I laid in bed and I started drifting off to sleep and I was in that kind of period of kind of sleepiness where, you, you know, you're still awake but you're not really sure what's happening and I was content. I remember that. I was more content than I've ever been ever. And I started drifting off and I was almost in a deep, deep slumber. And then all of a sudden in my brain, I just heard someone singing, try, 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 try. And I thought, you know what? $300, best fucking deal of all time. 
Do you want me to actually double it? Let's pay 600. Let's get that down. And I did. It's gone. I paid the money. You will not find it anywhere online. Now, there's going to be a rush after this to Google it on your phone. You won't find it. If you're in here tonight, you have the lyric sheets, which is the closest you will ever get to it, right? And I'm like, I'm happy it's gone, right? But there's a part of me in the back of my head was like, maybe I should have left it, right? Maybe I should have left it. Because you never know if you're actually doing something brilliant, especially in the arts, if you're making music, if you caught the song Try Music. But if <laughs> you make something, like, it's so subjective, you never know, right? And about a year ago, I went and saw Fleetwood Mac with my mum, right? Now, I love Fleetwood Mac. They're one of our favourite bands. Uh, it was so good. And uh, we went there. It was a Saturday night. It was date night. And uh, there was a lady <laughs> sitting three seats down from us that bought her own tambourine <laughs> and just played along with every song. What the fuck's that, right? Like, you can't do that. That's not allowed. There should be a no tambourine sign at the door. Should be legislation against... Actually, fuck it, that should be an act of terrorism, right? I don't know why we're worried about ISIS. I think Jennifer from Cogra is the real problem, right? Because that's so egotistical to do, do you know what I mean? She's gone to see Fleetwood Mac, right? Fleetwood Mac, one of the most critically acclaimed bands of all time, right? She's just gone in and gone... I know it'll make this better. <laughs> Right, me on the bloody tambourine, right? Take the night off, boys. I've got it, right? And she's banging away on this tambourine, finally gets to song 16 or 17 or whatever. She gets up, goes to the bar or the toilet, takes the tambourine with her. I'm just watching the show, no tambourine. All of a sudden I realise, oh, shit, she was right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It needed more tambourine. <laughs> you can be a genius. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for coming out. I really do appreciate it. Um, now... Now, now before I get out of here, now before I get out of here, uh, whenever I tell this story about MySpace, uh, people always have the same question. I like to tell a lot of dinner parties and to friends. It's a very funny story. And uh, whenever I tell the story, people always have the same question. They say, oh, what happened to Bianca Chan? Like, what's Bianca Chan up to? And I'm like, oh, like, you can just find her. She's a real person, like Google her. And uh, about, you know, the start of the year, about eight months ago, I was having lunch with some friends. It was a boozy lunch. And I told the story. And inevitably, at the end, they say, hey, what happened to Bianca Chan? And they're like, do you have her on Instagram and social media? And I was like, oh, I wrote a song about her and put her on MySpace. I definitely have her on Instagram. <laughs> She's number one searched on Instagram, right? And I showed... I showed them the photos and they're like, oh, cool, that's great, whatever. And uh, I got up, went to the toilet, and when I, I left my phone on the table. And when I came back, they had liked uh, every photo on her Instagram page <laughs> from 2014, right? That's, that's 64 photos, right? And I just broke out in a cold sweat. I was like, oh, <laughs> shit, right? This is no good. Then all of a sudden, my phone buzzed, right? And I had a direct message from Bianca Chan. I was like, oh, this is going to be good. And it said, hey, did you just like... 62 photos of mine uh, from 2014, right? And I was like, yes, because I couldn't lie, right? And I was like, I'm just going to have to come clean with it. So I was like, look, I was just at a, at a lunch with a bunch of people and uh, we were drinking a little bit and we started just randomly talking about nostalgia in school. Your name came up and I showed them their Instagram. I went to the toilet. When I came back, they had like 64 photos of yours from 2014, right? And for the most part, she took it pretty well. She was like, hey, that's pretty funny. I'd probably do something similar. And I was like, great, I'm out of it. And then about five minutes later, I get another message from her saying, hey, Sam, by the way, how are you? I hear you're doing comedy now. That's so exciting. What, like, what have you been up to? And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, we can have a bit of a chat. We can maybe rekindle our friendship and not the non-existent friendship. But, uh, <laughs> but I was like, great, whatever. And then I thought, you know what? Like, I love this MySpace story. I love telling people about this. And I was like, oh, I might want to do it on stage. Maybe I want to do it in stand-up. So I was like, I'm going to have to tell her about it, right? Because that'd be weird to, you know, not tell someone and then, you know, do stand-up about them. So I sent them a message. And I was like, hey, hey, Bianca. I was like, hey, by the way, I want to use your name in stand-up, if that's okay. It's just a good, old, nostalgic name. If that's okay to use it, like, I'd, like, I'd really appreciate that. And uh, she wrote back, she wrote, you know, it's, that's a bit weird, isn't it? And I was like, oh, it's not, it's not that weird. Do you know what I mean? It's not like, I'm, you know, write a whole show about it or, you know, film... <laughs> you know, like, film it live for ABC TV. Like, it's not... <laughs> like, it's not weird at all. And then she wrote back, and she said, oh, that's fine. She goes, it's fine, do it. And then she wrote, I do think it's a bit weird, though. And then she goes, actually... So weirder than that time you wrote that fucking song about me. <laughs> and then a follow-up message saying, try, 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 try. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate it so much. Uh, we had a good time. My name's Sam Totten. Thank you very much. Good night. Yeah.